This morning, I will read for you two gospel lessons. The first comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. And the second comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, verses 17 through 20. Listen to God's word. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage of Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back shortly. They went and found a colt outside on the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? And they answered, as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it, and many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut from the trees. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the Twelve. And our story continues a few days later with a story of Jesus in the upper room with his disciples. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, where do you want us to go and make preparations for the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, my teacher says, my time is near. I will keep Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus directed them, and they prepared a Passover meal. When it was evening, Jesus took place with the 12 disciples. And while they were eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. They became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will, put, will betray me. The Son of Man goes at, as it is written of him. But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one to not have even been born. Judas, who betrayed Jesus, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. And while they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is the cup of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we draw near to you this day, singing our praise and naming our hope as we approach this holiest of weeks. Although we know that the story doesn't end with either of these stories, we pray that you will draw near to us your spirit giving us living proof that your story continues 
upon and through us even today. As we approach your word to us, open our eyes and ears and hearts and minds and spirits, and may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. On July 28, 1917, 10,000 black people marched down New York City's Fifth Avenue in silence. Children who were dressed in white led the parade. They were followed by women and then men. This march became known as the Silent Parade organized by the NAACP and local church leaders, organized in response to the East St. Louis race riots of earlier that summer, in which mobs of white men numbered in the thousands brutally attacked hundreds of black residents and destroyed their homes. Author and theologian Cole Arthur Riley writes this, <clears throat> There is something unquestionably strange, tender, and beautiful strangeness in black organizers deciding they would be led by the young, that they would believe that these children had just as much power to protest as they did. And I think about how it is more than mere symbol that every adult in the crowd would have had to submit themselves to the pace of hundreds of ch tiny child footsteps, a redistribution of power in the body. This morning, <clears throat> known as Palm Sunday, is one in which we remember a parade of sorts that took place over two millennia ago. And this parade, too, carried an emphasis that reoriented and redistributed power. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a colt that had never been ridden, as the crowds took off their cloaks to create a path upon which this young donkey's hooves would trod, this parade was one in which their unconventional and unlikely Messiah entered Jerusalem while onlookers cried out, Hosanna, save us. In doing so, the crowd enacted their subversive hope that Jesus, that in Jesus, God would offer freedom, freedom from the political tyranny of the day, freedom from hatred, the freedom to be whole. This parade, too, was an act of resistance, a cry for change, and a declaration of hope. One commentator points out that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was incomplete in many ways. The fanfare of his arrival did not result in a grand, grand ritual or the expulsion of former vestiges of power or a banquet celebration, as one might expect. And at some point, Jesus got off the donkey and went into the temple and wandered off as one of the crowds. But one commentator goes on to write, this so-called triumphant procession of Jesus is intentionally incomplete and unconventional because the oppressed fight back in ways that are unexpected. In other words, this story is depicting to us the revolutionary side of Jesus and his disciples who performed their unconventional jab against the empire. This is their act of solidarity with the oppressed. This Sunday, celebrated as Palm Sunday by the Christian Church, ushers in Holy Week, where collectively we journey with Jesus to the cross on Calvary. 
We remember Jesus' last supper with his disciples and continue to tell the story of his betrayal and arrest and torture and crucifixion. Now next week, we will gather to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Our alleluias will be found and returned to us once more. We will celebrate that in the face of all of the powers that destroy, the power of God's love prevails even over death. And it is true that we can show up on Palm Sunday and again on Easter, and we can get caught up in celebration. We can praise Jesus as he rides into Jerusalem, and we can praise Jesus as he reigns victorious over death, and we should. But we can also choose to ignore the difficult realities that unfold in the space between and the difficult realities that are a part of our lives between one Sunday and the next and the difficulties in our world today. Now this year we've included a second gospel lesson in our service today. This is the passage that was assigned for Palm Sunday in our Lenten devotional from which we've been reading entitled, Meeting Jesus at Table. And so as we time travel within our service today, we witness Jesus and his disciples gathered around a table in the upper room in the midst of their Passover meal. It's here that Jesus takes bread and blesses it and breaks it. And then again, he takes the cup and offers a blessing once more sharing the cup with his disciples. He feeds his friends and he feeds his followers and he tells the truth that those who succumb to the powers that seek to destroy are not simply found out there in seats of power to which one can easily point. But rather, he says to his disciples, they're in here too among friends, among followers, among those whom Jesus had fed. The story that unfolds through palm processionals and upper rooms, through temple halls and civil courtrooms, through those who stayed and those who fled and those who wept and those who cried out for Jesus' crucifixion, this is a story about power. It's about the power of fear and the power of exhaustion. It's about the power of money, the power of authority, the power of religion, the power of government, the power of a mob, and the power of hate. And, and it is a story about the power of courage and a story of the power of perseverance, the power of self-giving, the power of accepting another. It is a story of the power of forgiveness, the power of grace, and the power of love that is stronger than any of the powers that would seek to harm or destroy even the power of death. And so I invite you to take this journey together. Let's not give ourselves permission to just gloss over the difficult parts of the story or the difficult parts of our lives. Rather, let's enter this holiest of weeks with humility and wonder, with a willingness to own our complicity in the systems of this world that harm or deny or kill, and let us too be fed by God's gracious and steadfast love, so much so that we might find it within ourselves to be courageous to show mercy 
and to walk in solidarity with those who live lives on society's margins. For it is when we do this that we are better situated to ask the important question of how we, with God, might better redistribute power within our bodies, within our body, and within the world. How can our action or how can our intentional rest reorient this world according to the economy of Christ? How can our intentional words and how can our intentional silence redistribute power according to the economy of Christ's kingdom? Now, I don't have one answer, and I don't think there's just one. But I have a few suggestions that I'll brainstorm with you this morning. We can give. We will be collecting the one great hour of sharing during this service. And we can give to an offering that aligns our mission with the mission of our larger church in caring for those who are on the margins of this world. We can listen, especially when we want to speak, and especially when we want to speak in defense of our own selves. And we can repent. We can repent by naming and confessing how our actions or inactions fuel the functions of this world that cause harm, sometimes through our ignorance and sometimes through our own selection of ease. But we can repent of these ways. We can learn. We can learn about how we benefit from our own social loca location, where we might hold privilege that has been unearned, and even when we hold privilege for which we have labored. We can see what we might need to release in order for someone else to be welcomed and well and whole. And perhaps even we can follow in the footsteps of young children changing the pace of our walk and listen when they remind us to take a turn, to be patient while we're waiting, or maybe to hold someone's hand while we cross a street. For we go this journey forward only together. With God's help, May it be so. Amen.